So welcome and thank you for joining me today. This is just giving us a brief overview of where the presentation is going to go. We'll talk about resilience and what we mean when we're talking about resilience. And then I'll go over a few recent events uh, where resilience is an important topic. And then we'll talk about some example studies in which the Remy 3 plus model was utilized in some resilience studies. And then how JE will take us through the model demonstration. And at the end, we'll open it up for questions and answers. For any of you who may not be familiar with REMI, REMI stands for Regional Economic Models Incorporated, and we provide economic modeling software, which is used for answering economic impact analysis questions, answering various what-if questions about the economy. So when we're talking about resilience, we mean the ability to recover from or adjust quickly to a change in circumstances. One great example of resilience is the COVID-19 pandemic. There has been huge disruption in the way that we do our work normally with social distancing and not being able to work in person for so many things, but we have been resilient and continue to uh, produce and uh, be productive uh, even during the pandemic using virtual technology. So this is an example of a disaster that has occurred and our ability to recover from that disaster and to continue operating even afterwards and during it. Uh, when we are thinking about other forms of resilience, you also have uh, resilience to natural disasters like floods, wildfires, earthquakes, um, blizzards. And um, you can also talk a little bit about resilient, or sorry, mitigation when you're talking about these issues as well. Where I, by mitigation, I mean it's something that you do before a disaster strikes in preparation for that disaster to mitigate some of the loss. An example of that would be building codes in California that are given high standards because of earthquake, with, earthquake risk. And so should an earthquake strike, the actual damage of the earthquake is less, it is mitigated because of those um, stringent building codes. This is tied very closely with resilience because it makes recovering from the disaster and reacting to disaster much easier. And when we're talking about power grid resilience, we can talk about, okay, the power goes out, what will we do? How quickly can we get the power back on? How can we continue to operate even without power? And then we also talk about how can we avoid power outages in the first place? So when you're considering the power grid resilience, um, reliability, resilience, and mitigation are all bundled up very closely together. Why do we need to model resilience? Well, resilience can sometimes be a bit of an unusual topic to discuss in economics. Typically, people are focused very much on efficiency, and resilience at first glance sometimes doesn't seem like the most efficient thing to be investing in. Therefore, with economic modeling, you can really quantify the value of having resilient systems, and you can alert people to the risks of not having resilient systems. This allows for better communication with policymakers um, when you're discussing whether you should be investing in resilience, and it allows you to have a little more clarity about how much you want to be investing in the issue. So one recent event that uh, dealt a lot with resilience was the ice storm that happened back in February that hit a huge swath of the uh, American South and even up into the Midwest. This was an issue because many areas were not prepared for this kind of weather. And we saw tons of power outages and a lot of property damage from burst pipes, a lot of lost productivity. The slide shows some of the states that were affected by the storm and the number of power outages that each state have had on February 16th. So some of the issues with having such widespread and long lasting power outages um, are listed on this slide. So in uh, Texas, specifically, we had 4.5 million homes and businesses without power. And without power in this situation also means without heat. 
uh, which cause many health issues like uh, hypothermia and frostbite. And there were in fact 11 deaths in Texas due to the storm and 23 deaths nationwide. Additionally, you have an estimated $195 billion in damages in Texas alone from the storm. And this is from loss in oil and gas production, from food processing facilities and manufacturing plant uh, damages and loss production, and then from property damages to homes and businesses with things like burst pipes. So the cost of power grid failure can be very high, especially in this specific situation that we've seen. Here are some other examples of power grid failure in the past. We have the Northeast blackout from 2003. And then on the right, we're looking at the uh, graph of Hurricane Irma in Florida. This is showing power outages by county. The darker red counties have more power outages and the um, lighter counties have fewer. This is by percent of the county without electricity. The, um, it shows September 11th and September 14th, uh, both dates after the hurricane. And um, it shows the ability to get electricity uh, back on. Uh, there is a huge improvement between the 11th and the 14th. When we're talking about power grid resilience, we're really talking about, in this context, blackouts and brownouts. A uh, blackout is the total loss of power in an area and is more common. And then there is the brownout, which is the temporary dimming or reduction in electricity. This does not happen as commonly anymore, I believe, but it is an issue mainly in manufacturing where a unexpected loss in power can cause huge amounts of damages to machines. So again, we're looking at the cost of power grid failure for infrastructure, productivity, even health, with manufacturing, production, closed businesses, property damage, and um, you know health health costs to uh, people um, having having health issues due to uh, severe weather and um, potentially exacerbated by the inability of the power grid to fail to deal with that weather, um, like in the winter storm example. Now I'm going to get into a couple of studies that uh, Remy participated in on resilience. This study is called Economic Analysis and Disaster Resiliency, and it was done by the Economic Development Administration. The premise of the study is that it provides an economic analysis of the effects of a hurricane event in Central Florida. And among other things, it deals with two uh, specific scenarios. One scenario is a normal recovery scenario after a hurricane, and this is based on historical research of the typical recovery trajectory that the area takes after various storms. Um, categories one through five, category one storm being less severe and category five storm being the most severe. Then we have the accelerated recovery rate scenario where it, you have the base scenario, but then you add one billion dollars of federal relief funding for each of the five counties that are within central florida in this simulation they looked at population employment regional domestic product combined personal income and sales tax revenue this graph shows population trends from that study after the um, different categories of storms so the red line is the projected population trend with no event, and then the rest of the lines are um, forecasted population trends after a category one through five event. This graph is actually showing the trajectory in the accelerated recovery scenario. So what this shows is that after a category one scenario, the accelerated rate of recovery, the one that includes $1 billion of increased funding, uh, gets population back to the no event forecast within five years. For the other category uh, storms, the accelerated rate situation is not enough to 
to maintain no event uh, population trends, but it does improve them. This graph can maybe more uh, clearly show the relationship between the baseline scenario of regular recovery rate and the um, accelerated recovery rate with the $1 billion of investment or of federal funds relief. This is showing the results after a potential category two storm. Again, the red line is the regularly forecast uh, level of employment in thousands of jobs. And then we can look at the yellow line, which is showing the forecast for employment after a category two storm. As you can see, it is about 20,000 jobs uh, below the forecasted jobs uh, with no event. Now we can look at the green line, which actually includes event-related construction jobs. So after a hurricane, you may see jobs relating to rebuilding infrastructure and you know mostly construction jobs. And so this gives you a bit of an initial spike in employment after the yellow uh, line. And then it eventually tapers back in with the yellow line as these event-related jobs start to fade out. Now we can look at the dotted blue line which is the federal infusion line or the accelerated rate of recovery, which includes the $1 billion of federal funds. This shows that it actually projects the employment above the normally expected employment levels uh, for the region if there had been no storm. Now this graph shows the same thing, but consider there is a category three hurricane instead of a category two hurricane. In this situation, the accelerated rate of recovery is matched pretty well to the uh, forecasted no event line. So in this case, the idea of resilience is working very well and um, the economy is able to quickly recover and to um, behave close to how it normally would had there been no hurricane. But you can move on to a category four hurricane and see that in fact the, even the accelerated rate of recovery is not enough to project the line up to the same levels of employment that you would have had had there been no storm at all. Um, however, you still do see an improvement there. There are also there's also graphs and information in this study for category one and category five storms, but for the purpose of this webinar, I've kept it to um, two graphs two, three, and four. The second study that I wanted to discuss uh, is about um, modeling resilience uh, with E3+. This was a study called uh, Modeling Economic Resilience to Disasters by Dr. Adam Rose and Dan Wei. This was part of the Seoul Price School of Public Policy and the Center for Risk and Economic Analysis of Terrorism Events uh, from the University of Southern California. This slide, um, on the left, the little square is pulled from a presentation that Adam Rose did with us about the results. A scenario with there is a 90 day port disruption. This means a huge disruption in productivity and activity around a port uh, with trades and exports. So on the left, the little table that you're looking at there is basically plugging in different resilience methods and then comparing the, these methods, the results after these methods um, to the baseline disruption forecast. Um, in this scenario, they examined employment, GDP, and gross output results. In the previous slide, we were talking about, or I mentioned different um, resilience methods uh, that were compared. This table shows a few different resilience tactics and their definitions, and um, it kind of explains what the little graph in the previous slide was talking about. When we are thinking about power grid resilience, something that might be interesting to look at is 
um, something like input substitution or excess capacity. That's replacing a production input in short supply with another or using plant or equipment that was idle um, when what you were originally using uh, does, is not working. This could potentially see, be seen as having access to backup generators. Um, for example, hospitals have backup generators so that they're very resilient to power outages and when they happen, they can continue to uh, function normally and avoid a lot of um, risks to health and costs. At this point, we're looking at some of the outcomes from uh, the, that study. So looking through the rows, we can start with the base case, which is showing, showing the amount of cost in employment, GDP, and gross output that you would see if there was a 90-day port disruption. And then you can look at the other rows with export diversion, with conservation, with production recapture. These are different resilience tactics. And it shows the level of lost employment, GDP, and gross output with these different tactics. And at the bottom, you can see the effect of the combined resilience tactics here. All the way on the right side of the, of the table, we're looking at resilience loss reduction potential in terms of GDP. For combined resilience, this is 63.6%. The resilience loss reduction potential is the amount of avoided damage divided by the maximum amount of potential damage times 100. So what this 63.6% means is that 63.6% of damage was actually, potential damage was actually avoided um, due to these combined resilience tactics in this scenario. So this resilience loss reduction potential figure, otherwise known as the RLRP, is actually inside of the Remy E3 plus model. And Hao Jiayi will be able to uh, show that to you guys when she is doing her model demonstration. I'm now going to turn things over to Hao Jiayi, who will be talking about her scenarios in her uh, model demonstration. Um, excuse me while I take a minute to change the presenter to Hao Jiayi so that she can be sharing her screen with us. Okay, I believe you are a presenter now. And I'm looking at the slides, so it looks like things are all set. Yeah. Thank you, Alexandro. Um, so now I'm going to introduce the model scenario that we have in the demonstration. So basically, we will have two scenarios. Uh, the first one is the resilience, resilience scenario. Um, in this case, I will assume there is a direct power outage shock. And, and then I will be using the E3 plus resiliency module. And then in the second scenario, uh, it's about an electric infrastructure improvement plan. So um, it's an investment of a reliability-focused electric system. And then this investment uh, can help prevent power outages, uh, modernize the electric grid, and then reduce the impact of extreme weather on the electric infrastructure. So that's the two scenarios that we have. And then I will run to forecast here. Um, in this scenario, we have a power outage shock with versus without the resilient electric system. And then the methodology for this scenario is like, uh, I'm going to run two forecasts, the control forecast and then the resilient forecast. In the control forecast, I will assume there will be 1% decrease in the baseline output for a year 2021, and then there will be a 0.5% a decrease for year 2022. So that will affect all the industries. For the resilient forecast, I will assume there will be a 0.5% increase in the simul simulation output. So that, that, is, that is like bounce back, uh, bounce back from the baseline because, well, because we have this resilient electric system. 
So the difference of these two forecasts will show you the, elect, uh, e um, the economic impacts of having a resilient electric system. That's the scenario one. And then for the scenario two, I will have the economic impacts of investing in electric infrastructure. So the methodology is to assume we are going to invest appro approximately one billion for the following five years. That, that is uh, to assume the investment will last for five years. And in this case, I will increase the industry sales for the utility system construction. And because there will be like more business cost savings for commercial and industrial sectors due to fuel outages and higher electric power quality. Uh, so that's why I'm increasing the business cost savings here. And, and also I will increase the property tax uh, because firms will earn more profits and they will pay more tax. So lastly, I will also increase the electricity rate um, because the users will uh, pay for a bit higher electricity rate, which is necessary to support the infrastructure improvements. So that's the methodology for the scenario two. And then here are the policy variables that we use for scenario two. Uh, so basically it will be five major policy variables and I will go through each of them in my demonstration. So let's get to the demonstration now. Okay, so now, uh, now we are looking at our E3 Plus product interface and we can see I'm using a Pennsylvania model here. So if if we go to the regional profile, we see we have Western region, Central region, and Eastern region. So there are three regions here uh, for this model. And we are using a seven T sectors. So here we see we have a new regional control and then national control. So those control forecasts will be served as our baseline forecast. And then we, we also have a regional simulation forecast. So then I will walk you through the process of starting a new regional simulation. So first we can just click the new regional simulation. And then here um, also click the new simulation. And now we, can, uh, we are going to the select inputs page. So basically there is a full list here. We can go to the full list. And then here, here are all the policy variables that we have. When, and you can select like uh, the policy variable that you may need for your study. And you can also select the policy variable according to different topics and scenarios. For example, uh, for different industries, you could select like different policy variables. And after setting up the policy variables, all the policy variables that you selected will go to the input list. And then in the forecast options, you may choose the time period that you would like to run for the forecast and then you hit the forecast button. So the forecast will run automatically, automatically for you. And the results page will show all the economic demographic results that they have for this study. Yeah, so that's how you, uh, how you are going to do a new simulation. So in this demonstration, I already run all the forecast for you. So, uh, we can have a look at our first scenario. We could go to the studies here, the studies on the left column, and then we see actually we have uh, three studies here, the forecast ranking, calculate multipliers, and natural disaster resiliency. Uh, so here I'm going to introduce this one, the natural disaster resilience, uh, which is a very unique feature of the Remy E3 Plus product. And let's have a look at this scenario. Okay. So as, we're, um, as we have already known, in this scenario, we assume there is a power outage shock. So in the disaster baseline control forecast, I selected the pulse variable that modeled the negative effect of this uh, outage shock. So in this case, I choose the output policy variable and then the industries, I actually choose all the industries because 
So I think like uh, almost all the industries will be affected by the power outage. Um, and the regions is uh, all the regions in Pennsylvania. The values here is like I assume the negative shock, uh, the negative shock in the first year is to decrease the output by 1%. And then there's still some remaining negative effects uh, for the second year. So it will decrease the output by 0.5%. And then we can add a resiliency scenario here in which we can select the policy variable that model the mitigation and resiliency efforts. So I'm using the output policy variable and, and the same it's all is for all the industries and all regions. And here I'm, uh, I, will, I will increase the output by 0.5% in the first year and then by 0.5% in the second year. So as we can see, we actually have two forecasts here. Uh, so we have the power outage shock without any resilience efforts. And this one, the resilient forecast, I actually use the control forecast as its baseline. And then it captures the net effect of the disaster, less the economic inactivity averted by the resilience efforts. And we are going to compare the results from these two forecasts. And then I will go to the forecast, forecast page and hit the wrong button here. So it will run uh, these two forecasts automatically uh, in the period of 2019 to 2030. And then go to the result page. So here are the, our results page. Um, actually, it showed us three very important economic uh, indicators. So that's output, GDP, and employment. And then for the output, for example, we actually have four blocks here. So the red block, you can see uh, if I click the red block, then there will be a red shadow showing the graph. And this one actually captured the total maximum loss potential. So uh, with the power outage shock, um, so it's a hypothetical shock and it's really big shock. So we will have a 33 billion loss in the output. However, uh, if I click the a second block, which is the yellow one, and it will show the yellow shadow. So the yellow shadow is the actual loss in the resilience scenario. So if we have resilient measures, then the actual loss in output is 11 billion. So in this case, if we take a difference of these two numbers and we will have this green shadow here, so it's a 22 billion. So actually the avoided loss due to this resilience measures is 22 billion shown in this uh, shadow and then we can calculate the resilience loss re reduction potential as already mentioned by Alexandra. so here is 66 percent um, which we use the 22 billion divided by the 33 billion so here is the example for the output and we also show very similar results for the gdp and we can also have a deeper look um, have a closer look on the employment so if without any resilience measurements, um, then the employment will be reduced by 206,000 jobs. So that's a 206,000 job loss. However, the actual loss is like 30,000. So we are avoiding 136,000 jobs. And then the same, we can also calculate the loss reduction potential. So uh, the results actually show us the importance of taking resilience measures because things can be uh, really bad without any resilience actions. So this module is actually pretty useful because it has a built-in calculations that can help us quantify the avoided loss due to the resilience measures. So here, here this one is the most important part. So this one, uh, so here is about our scenario one. And then we may go to the scenario two. So I will go to the view forecast and then click um, this scenario two. So the first thing that um, we, we can look at is the input list. So um, as I already mentioned, we have like five major policy variables, and then in the drop down list, in the drop down list, we actually can see all the uh, details for the policy variable inputs. 
So for the infrastructure investment, actually I choose the uh, I choose the detailed industry sales, and then the industry I use is the power and communication structures. It's belong to the uh, utility construction sector, and then the region I chose is eastern region. So um, it's the eastern uh, Pennsylvania, and then I will spreading out all the one billion investment across this uh, across these five years. So that's the infrastructure investment. And the second one is the production cost. Um, so basically I spread out the total the total reduced production cost across all the 66 private uh, private non-farm industries according to their intermediate input, uh, intermediate demand for electricity. So oh, actually we have a you can go to the editor. And, and then there is a spreader. So here, actually we have, uh, we can go to the spreader here and then and then you can input all the value to spread and, and the, it can, you can choose the spreading options as well as the spreading weight. So all this, all these spreaders, uh, the spreader function can spread all the values automatically for you. And that's the production cost reduction. And the next one is the property tax revenue increase. Because we have higher profit, so that means higher tax. And the state government, the local government will receive higher tax revenue um, with a balanced budget. They will also, they will also increase their uh, spending. So that's why we're in, we're, we have a local government spending here. So these three are the positive in, uh, the positive shocks that we have: the infrastructure investment, production cost reduction, and property tax revenue. And then let's have a look at the rate uh, rate increase. So there will be rate increase for the residential users, as well as uh, electricity price increase for the industrial and commercial users. So these two are the are the negative effects of um, of this investment. So actually, this uh, results will show you the net the net economic benefit or loss due to this investment. So here are uh, here is our input list, and then I can go to the forecast options. Um, I choose the time period is from 2019 to 2030, and then I will hit the run button. So I already run it for you. And then we can go to the results page. Um, here we actually have lots of folders here. Um, we have the energy and snapshots about the economic summary. And then also we have detailed economic folder that will show you all the detailed information about uh, econ economic indicators. We also have a detailed demographic uh, folder that will show you all the um, the population and components information. So today I'm going to use the energy sum, uh, the graphs from the energy summary and also the economic summary, and I will I will put all the graphs into the favorites folder just for the purpose of this presentation. Yeah, so they are all in the favorite folder now. And before I show the visualizations, I will click the master selection here and then set the region as the eastern region and the comparison type I will set it as the differences so our forecast simulation forecast will be so the first one is the GDP and output as we can see there is a growing GDP and output the yellow line is the output and then the blue line is the GDP. So that means more goods and services uh, due to the new investment activities. And the next one that I'm going to show is the employment. Uh, so this new construction, this new investment activities will actually bring more jobs to the economy. Uh, it's something that we would like to see. So if I go to if I go to the options here, we can show the legend. So now we, we can see that we have two categories here, the total employment and then the resident uh, the res resident adjusted employment. So the total employment is measured by place of work 
and in the resident adjusting employment is measured by place of residence. And if we uh, if we go to the show table here, we can show it can show you the exact numbers of the job creation. Like for the first year, the job increased by uh, three thousand and eight hundred, um, and it keep growing. Um, for in the first in the fifth years, the job creation is like twelve thousand. So that will give you a very uh, clear insights on how much a job has been created. And then we can go to the employment by industry graph. So this graph actually shows you the top 10, top 10 uh, job increase by industry. So if I also show the legend here. So actually it will show you how the investment will support economic activities in the different, in all the different industries. Uh, let's see the top one job increase comes from the construction industry and also their uh, job creation, hotel trade, uh, government, and also some service areas. Yeah. So, so here is the result for employment and then more jobs means more uh, means higher labor income. So that's why we also see um, the personal income and disposable income is are growing. So the personal income actually are the sources of all the income sources received by person. So um, that includes um, like wages, salaries, supplements, transfer payments. So that includes everything. And for the disposable income is a, is the after tax income received by person. So we have higher uh, income here, and that will contribute to higher um, higher personal income tax. Uh, so that will also generate a positive physical physical impacts to the local government. Um, the last one is the energy consumption that I'd like to show. So this graph actually show you the electricity consumption for residential, commercial, and industrial users. For the residential users, um, the con consumption decrease due to a higher electricity rate. However, for the commercial user, commercial and industrial users, we see the consumption is increasing uh, because the increase in fuel costs are offset by the reduced production cost. So they, they actually consume more electricity. And if we go to the options, if we go to the data filter selection, and then the fuel type. So we see we actually have like many different fuel types. You could choose uh, petroleum, and also you could choose like coal. Uh, for the sake of this presentation, I choose the electricity here. And also in the details one, you could choose total. So here it will show you the total consumption on electricity. And we see the total electricity is decreasing in the first two years due to a lower in commercial, uh, due to lower in re residential users consumption. However, it's increasing because uh, because the commercial and industrial users consume more of the electricity. Yeah, so now we can see uh, the net economic benefits of investing in, in, um, in a more reliable electric infrastructure. And it's, uh, and it's justifiable to raise the electricity rate a bit to support the investment activity.